when I was working with startups and with small companies, I did it the old school way. So I see crowdfunding as very much a disruptive technology right now. But like many of the sweet smelling roses in the gardens, it's also got some pretty sharp thorns. Um, and so we want to look at this in terms of what it will do, but also where you have to be careful. Um, so let me give you some introduction in terms of uh, why we're looking at this. So which one do I hit? Okay. All right. Old way of looking at the business um, evolution. And some of you have indicated from your introduction that you're in it. Back here, when you're just developing a concept, your need for money, your net cash flow, uh, sometimes covered by universities, grants that you don't have to pay back. Maybe you get to a proof of concept, working prototype, but pretty soon, your funding needs begin to grow. <clears throat> Defining the product, actually building one if it's a physical product, and where you go down to the business plan, product introduction, and begin your um, marketing traditionally, that's where you hit your big needs, where you would need somewhere between two and say $25 million. Usually, you don't hit the venture capital until you get to this range. You have to figure out how you get the money back here. And then when finally you do get your venture capital, build the business and become cash flow positive. That's the old way of looking at a business. But it's still true in terms of, of any business you build that you're going to go into negative cash flow. So in the traditional model, there were a lot of venture capitalists that were interested in putting in what people commonly call the A round, your very first round of outside capital and its equity. But right now, most investors, venture investors, want to see a real product and they want to see real customers uh, before they'll put money in. Which leads to the question, how do I get the money to get to the point where I've got a real product, I've got real customers, and I've, I've got real revenue? That's the dilemma that's hanging out there in the marketplace right now. It, it puts the focus on quickly defining a product and getting some customer interest one way or another. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you could get a business plan, an idea, a concept funded. That's not what happens with venture capital anymore. So you're left with, before crowdfunding, going to business plan competitions, or you may be in competition with 50 other companies and there's one big prize winner and it's like $10,000 or $50,000, sometimes $100,000. That's the way people were funding their plans. A lot of friends and family money, um, a lot of working outside uh, another job. Um, but with the withdrawal of the venture capital money, funding a new startup has become much more difficult. So. If you are now focused on trying to get to a real product, trying to get initial sales, that's a focus very different than putting together a slick business plan and 10 great slides. But it also happens to be completely congruent with what you need to crowd from. So I'm not going to read this whole thing. And by the way, all of this is available uh, online um, on our resource page there that Thomas has put together. Um, if you involve new engineering and new hardware, it takes a lot longer and more money than you ever think. And the track record of VC investors uh, in clean tech has not been very good. Um, they haven't been getting really good exits. Medical technology is a little bit better. Software in general is among the best things that you can do. They're fast to get a product out there and get it tested. Um, so, uh, if you're in clean tech, um, they're sort of fads that come and go. Right now, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, batteries are the hot items. Solar not so hot. If you're in fuel cells and biofuels, dead. Um, and that didn't used to be the situation before. So the, the gap in funding, whether it's angel funding or VC funding, 
has really been filled in by crowdfunding. Now this particular set of data also includes what's called crowd lending. Uh, and that's a lot of real estate deals. And so that's the majority of what's been the uptick in the last few years. But the trend is similar if you just pull out the equity part of it, um, that it's the fastest growing part of the ways to fund new companies. And the angle upward is important. So there's also been a book out there called The Lean Startup, Brad Feld. Mm -hmm. Very similar. He says, bootstrap your way, which is to find a product, get out there and sell it, sell it for more than what it costs you, and build a business that way. That's great if you can do that. But a lot of businesses, you can't be profitable from day one. So it's great advice. It doesn't always work in terms of trying to find the money to keep going. So that's why we're here. What's been the success in crowdfunding? Well, it's been going on for a number of years. Uh, recently, as Chris and others will talk about, there have been some rule changes, some new laws, um, opening the door more widely. It's just now beginning to hit its stride. But in the past, people have been successful in raising millions of dollars. In other words, an amount equivalent to what they previously had gotten from VC investors. But there have been hundreds and hundreds of campaigns and still the list of you know, the great successes. It's not that long. What you do have is a lot of successes that are modest. So uh, we've given some examples here. Um, locally, Life Harmonic uh, is doing high quality audio accessories. They raised $1.7 million. A company called, called Tenkiv recently just did their first equity crowdfunding and it was worth uh, $50,000, $60,000 and they're doing another one. Um, I was involved with a company called New Wallet, which was essentially a, a, a case for your uh, smartphone. Mm -hmm. um, in that campaign, we raised $26,000, but more importantly, we got, what was it, like 490 orders for the product, so that was customer proof. With that, we got our VC money, and with the VC money, we got venture debt as well. So that turned into a million dollars that launched the company, and it's selling now and it's in catalogs, it's in, it's in the Apple store, et cetera. So there have been local successes, there's been these examples we see uh, outside. So it does say um, there is something to be done here. And statistically, um, and it, it, it's hard to get your arms around <laughs> what's a success rate. How do you define success? In some cases, in these statistics, people say you raise any amount of money and it's a success. And others, they say, you raise your target amount of money, uh, and that's the minimum criteria for success. But no matter how you define it, it appears that the success rate is higher getting money this way than going and pitching VCs, going and winning business plan competitions, and that's the attraction. But these campaigns have to be well planned. You don't have a whole big window of time. So you're probably going to spend months getting ready for it. And most campaigns raise less than $50,000. Now, if you're looking to cover one or $2 million as your product need, that first campaign that you do is not going to do it in all likelihood. But we'll come to an important caveat on that. For all campaigns, including um, appeals for donations for a kid's birthday party, the average amount raised is about $7,000. Now, that's dominated by those appeals. The business stuff that's out there, twenty-five, dollars $75,000 is very typical for a first campaign where you can actually talk about a product. And you shouldn't think about crowdfunding as a one-time event. And there's actually a ladder that you can use. A donation or a rewards-based campaign uh, is down at the bottom. You can get on there today, and even with some of the cool ideas you've talked about, and say, you know, help me get this idea going. And if you've done it well, if you've got a good email campaign going, if you have done some work to get yourself on Google with some articles, with some releases, with some Facebook work, you can raise 10,000 bucks on that. If you actually have something you can give away, which doesn't necessarily mean it has to be your product, it could be 
a coffee mug. It could be a discount on your, your product when it's done. It could be a number of things. You can raise more. New Wallet gave a discount on um, receiving its, its first product, and that did attract a lot of, of interest. But at some point, the thing that you have to give in order to raise a fair amount of money is equity, shares in your company. You have to share ownership. That's where you begin to cross the line into getting into some complicated matters with the law. Um, the new regulations, the new act, has expanded the ability of the ordinary citizen, somebody that's not what's called an accredited investor, somebody that has enough wealth that, you know, you can make any stupid investment you want, it's up to you, you're a big boy, to people who are not accredited investors, but they're limited the amount of money they can put in, and you're limited the amount of money you can raise. Um, in addition, if you start selling shares, I'm sure as Chris will talk about, you're accumulating something that could be a problem later. It's called shareholders. And when you want to do something, if you want to raise a real institutional round with a big player, they're going to look at people potentially and say, you've got 600 shareholders? I'm going to have to get them to agree uh, with what, you, what we want to do here and knowing that it might be a down round, which means the value of your company is less than what you thought it would be, get them all to agree. That's a complication. You can continue selling more and more equity going up the ladder until you get to the top rung where the amount you can raise is $50 million. That definitely is an, an equity sale. That definitely is something you're going to need legal, heat on, legal help on. And you're going to need to do some SEC filings. But one implication of going up this ladder as it's laid out here is you may be destined to become a public company because the institutional investors are going to have a bad feeling about all those shareholders you have. Now, that's today. My guess is somebody's going to figure this out. Somebody will be out there and they'll create an app or a way of doing things or a way of rolling all these things up or paying off the old investors that will get people out of this trap. So there's a need. We haven't seen it completely satisfied yet. I think something's going to happen. But my final comment is reality check on what we're going to talk about. Um, based on everything I've been able to read, based on experience, etc., it takes a lot more preparation than you think. You've got to get the right email list. You've got to have something going on Facebook and Twitter beforehand. The first time people hear about you can't be when they get an email um, and says, give me 20 bucks, or give me 200 bucks, or give me 1,000 bucks. You've got to build up to it. So, it's probably going to take nine months to do a good campaign that will raise any significant amount of money for There have been fraudulent campaigns, thankfully not many, uh, a few percent. But given that you can raise $25, $50 million, somebody is going to start exploiting this for fraudulent purposes. And that's going to be more rules, that's going to be more restrictions, and it's going to change the aroma of of doing crowdfunding, and you have to be aware of that. Now, I think, you know, there'll be more restrictions. People who stay within the, the color within the lines will be okay. But it's not just the abuse. It's that, think of yourself getting 10 crowdfunding appeals a day on your email inbox. At some point, you just become numb to the whole thing. So watch out. Therefore, if you want to use crowdfunding, it's in its infancy right now, and this may be the best time to use it. So uh, the advice would be, do it soon. Because I think a, a successful raise failure to deliver is also not necessarily fraudulent, because it turns into kind of a PR nightmare and a customer service nightmare. I was, I donated to one of those that just blew up on them. Yeah, I have donated to them too. Yeah. Uh, the product never got built. I don't consider that fraudulent. But no, not fraudulent, but I mean it's... Yeah, there, there are other different. cases where um, the money didn't even go to what they said it was going to go to. Somebody just put it in their pocket and skipped town. Yeah. So, um, but there's also the, the failure to produce the product. Um, let me see. Yeah, can they do, can people do like crowdfunding with convertible or safe notes? Well, I think probably Manny may address some of that. Um, there is a crowd lending approach, which is essentially notes. 
But what you have to have and the guarantees you have to give to get into that realm are tough. And if it's a small company and it's basically you and a couple other people, it comes down to are you willing to personally guarantee it? Are you willing to put your house on the line in order to get that money? I'd advise against it. Um, when you do that, you just go to the bank and take out an equity loan. Well, I think even the bank, um, there's a gap. The bank won't do everything that, that, that you might be able to do on crowd lending, but you got to watch out for it. Um, yeah, I've, I've been doing a lot of research on crowdfunding, and um, I actually applied to WeFunder. And basically, they said that I needed to be, you know, to have more um, followers and things like that. And, and I agree with them. It's just that my particular model, the crowdfunding platform within itself, is actually a good marketing tool. I was basically going to use the, the crowdfunding as a platform for all the legal documents and all that that I would have had to pay an attorney for to get my, you know, to start my, um, my uh, you know, uh, funding because, you know, I'm a ride chair driver. Right. I'm a Lyft driver. And so people that I want to invest, obviously, would be more Lyft and ride chair drivers. And I have a list of like 150,000 of them. It's just that I don't actually have the platform yet in order for them to actually, um, you know, start doing the drivers by zip code, um, you know, business model. But I thought that if I had the crowdfunding first, you know, what do you think about that? Because I've been dying to come to this meeting to ask you that. Well, I, I think that's a perfectly legitimate way to go forward, so long as my advice would be okay. you're gathering that money on what's called a donation to rewards basis. Don't sell shares on the basis of I haven't got all my legal documents together, but I want to launch this idea. Um, and I think you'll raise money that way. Man, I'm sure has a view on this. But if, but if you put an appeal out there, and particularly if you can hit an emotional high note with somebody, you know, whether you're raising this money from Lyft and Uber drivers who are dissatisfied, or you're hitting the people with, you know, they, they need rides or they'd rather do it with an electric vehicle, if, if you can, can phrase your campaign in a way that, that gets an emotional appeal into it, you will raise money. And I've seen lots of people take that first $10,000 and that goes to get all your documents in good shape. And then with that, you do another campaign and you raise another $25,000. That's why I say, don't think about this as one step. And the other thing I've seen people do is, at this point, you probably have a better number, but there, there are hundreds of crowdfunding platforms. Yeah, there are now. You can do the exact same campaign on different platforms so long as you don't contact the same people. Because there's not really not much point in contacting the same people. Um, but things like Facebook will sell you lists of names and you define, you know, age group, socioeconomic status, college education, all that sort of stuff that you think is where you want to be. And so you can go national with this through services that provide you uh, access to, to names and addresses. It's fairly cheap. Um, with New Wallet, what we did was um, each time we put out an email blast to um, get a return, we analyzed who was actually putting money in. So the first round was one or two percent response rate on our email learned of that and then then we bought names of this, what are the target in a particular way we got a five percent return did that through several rounds the last round that we did that was very precise in the type of person we were trying to get a 20 percent return wow. that's when we raised our, our biggest amount of money so if you can get a 20 percent hit rate with the people you send it out to you can do pretty well it takes some skill in order to get there 